Hello everybody, Mr. Dunley here, and today I will be playing Europa Universalis 4. Nope, this is not Crusader Kings 2, though it is made by the same company, Paradox Development Studio. Um, I decided to end my, oh, well, if you didn't already guess, I've already decided to end my Crusader Kings series, just because I don't know enough about the game, really. Um, but Europa Universalis 4 is a game I like to think I know much more about compared to Crusader Kings 2. So this time I'm going to do a let's play of this. Um, I'll record in a similar fashion to what I do with my Crusader Kings series. As in I'll do four, probably about four playthroughs a day then upload them either daily or every two days. I say that now. Um, but anyway I'm going to be playing this with a few mods. I haven't, I, even though I have got Conquest of Paradise I haven't installed that just because it does lag my game down quite a bit. Surprisingly considering a lot of people say this runs a lot better than most Paradox titles, um, but for mine it really heaves down on it. But I do have a few mods installed, so I'll show you that now. Uh, so these are the mods I've got active. I've got formable nations, so you got more variety of nations that can be formed, such as the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire. Uh, indestructible buildings, just because. Lowered opinion modifiers, nerfed rebels slightly. Uh, no protect roots, Northern England flavour, which probably won't really come into account a lot this uh, this playthrough. Spreading culture, the tenth idea, and voluntary abdication, which is a pretty important mod, I find. Um, so I'm going to be playing as I'm um, going from the 1444 start, as uh, you usually play through. I was tempted to start from 1453, but it won't really impact on who I'll be playing as. Who will be playing as? You ask? Well, not Castile. <laughs> like I did with uh, Castile Kings, that was... Nah, I've decided not to play as a uh, Castile this time. I think they're just a bit... A bit... What you expect people to play as. It's normally Castile or someone will play as. England, I've seen a lot of playthroughs. It, it is a bit more interesting than Castile, but it's not a playthrough I like. Muscovy is another common playthrough, but I think they're personally too easy. So I wouldn't go for them. Sweden, I was pretty tempted to play as. Um, see, breakthrough from Denmark. Uh, but it's nothing new. It's it's pretty much the same moves a lot of people make. Like, you'll break through from Denmark. If you can, expand it in Novgorod before Muscovy get there. Normally by that stage, you're powerful enough to take on Norway. Because Norway, I, if haven't been inherited by Denmark, he needs you to take over and yada yada yada. Uh, at the minute, in my personal time, I've been playing as the Hansa. And that's been going well. I'm almost close to form in Germany. I think I'm up to about just under 1600 AD, I think. About 1580 AD. I was tempted to play them through again, but I've been insanely lucky when it's came to that. So I thought, nah, go for a nation no one really expects. So I went decided to go with the Crimea, surprisingly. Uh, I've been playing through this in a multiplayer game with uh, one of my friends. Um, and it's been actually going well. He's been playing as the Ottomans, so we're being like historical allies. And he's just been expanding southwards while I've been expanding northwards and slightly uh, eastwards. Um, but I'll see if I can do the same thing single player. I think it's actually a very entertaining nation to play, really. So I'm going to go for the Crimea. So uh, let's get started then. Once the game initializes. So I'll do the same thing as I do with Crusader Kings. In that I'll just do a very brief tutorial. Uh, like showing you what everything does. For people that are not aware of the series of... Um, Europa Universalis. So I'll do that very, very quickly. Right, starting from the top bars along the top, you got the treasury, yeah, your manpower, your stability, prestige, legitimacy, and some of that's quite new power projection. Uh, these are pretty much self explanatory, but I'll explain them anyways. Money, how many men you can kind of recruit, like what's in your pool to like, recruit from. So if I want to recruit a unit, that'd take a thousand manpower, a thousand manpower gets a uh, thousand takes. Gets taken away from the eighteen thousand I'd have stability. Um, that can works from uh, from minus three to plus three. Minus three means you're heretically unstable, um, and plus three means you're perfectly stable kind of thing. So it's, by default, starts at zero. Prestige uh, doesn't work like it did in Crusader Kings, where it was almost like a score, I believe. I'm trying to. <laughs> this is my old memory. Um, this works. Yeah, well, have a little read of it. it. Affects many things, but probably how likely the nations are to accept your proposals, and how likely it is that your moral managers result in personal unions, and does affect quite a thing like global trade power and morale of armies. So that's very important to have high, but it does go down uh, over time. 
Uh, legitimacy is how legitimate marks are perceived by their subjects as well. We can not massively important, but it's always good to keep the legitimacy high. Some nations, if you're a republic, don't have legitimacy because you can't get into royal marriages. And then there's power projection, which is very important. Um, it doesn't really explain, as it says there, it's very difficult to explain, but um, pretty much you make yourself rivals, and if you win wars or battles or have them as a rival for a long time, you get power points. And that gives you the following effect. So if you have 25 power projection, you can have one leader of power and upkeep. But if I have 50 power projection, I get plus one admin that will mark a military point. I'm trying to explain as quickly as I can. Since I was talking about those points, these are them here. And you need to buy these, use these for technologies, all kinds of things, really. These pretty much these influence your entire game, basically. Um, well, pretty much admin points you use for um, Corin, which is like making a conquered nation basically part of your nation now. Uh, diplomatic points are used quite a lot in peace deals if you're trying to like get a peace which you want more than you're currently on. So for example, say I wanted, I went to war with Genoa for Kaffa and um, I wanted Azoz as well because I conquered them as well. It costs diplomatic points to get Azoz, Azov, sorry, not Kaffa. Kaffa doesn't because that's the war goal, if that makes sense. And military points is probably the least used, I would say. It's mainly for buildings and uh, and military leaders. Um, that's some military points you normally, especially the Crimea, you especially have a surplus of. Um, but different nations have different uh, views on that. Um, in the top here, which I've got to mention, you have your merchants, so they're used for trade. Your colonists, which I don't have any of because reasons. Um, dipl diplomats, so self-explanatory, and missionaries, they're pretty self-explanatory really what they do. Uh, over here, where you similar to what it is in uh, Crusader Kings, where you have little notifications. So this first one tells me that I need to uh, pick some rivals, because that you're required now. Well, you're not required, but it's very encouraged, because you get penalty on power projection. Um, tells me I can hire a free advisor. Disputed succession, which means... Um, I can, if I formed a royal marriage with that nation, I could kind of have been a personal union with that nation, possibly, not certain, it doesn't happen very often, it's never actually happened to me before. I've been part of one when I was a lesser partner, but yeah, yeah. I need to select a mission, so that's not selecting, that's normally the first thing I'll do, and I can hire a free military leader. Hopefully, you're, hopefully you're all following this. Top right, just got your date, your uh, score, how much score you get per month. Over here you have a different selection of map modes, so you can check religion, so I'm part of the Sunni religion map mode, there's orthodoxy and Catholic is all the way down here. Um, there's other ones like technology which isn't important because everyone's green at the minute, part of the Indian and Chinese nations. Uh, which is, that means they're just buying tech, so by default everyone starts pretty much on 333, and these will be on 222. That's uh, that's a good dance number, I suppose. Two, 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 and then there's all these other ones. All of these I don't use really. I just keep it on political map mode, like you do in Crusader Kings. Um, if I go onto here, you have another tab where it shows you uh, different statistics. Lovely. First one is your government, which you can just have a look. So this is where you recruit your advisors, and this is how many. Um, over here, you have your uh, who your leader is. So Khan Haji the first Giri. Um, this is how good of a leader he is, so him as a leader gives me three power points, uh, three admin points, three diplomatic points, and four military points. And these are told, these are how much I'll be getting per month, five, five, and six, as I'll show also up here. Um, what else do I need to go for? Nothing really else, apart from being recruit advisors over here, which I don't know if I've already said. Um, what uh, the government form I am, so I'm a steppy nomad, and these give the bo uh, boosts it gives you, like... So I get 50% natural manpower modifier, 50% land force limits modifier, and minus 50% better relations over time. And diplomacy, it's where you choose your rivals and you have diplomatic actions against other uh, countries as well as how many diplomatic relations you can be in. So I have a maximum of four. Some people can have to a maximum of five and six. Uh, then you have diplomatic rep reputation, which is affected by legitimacy. These. Uh, increases in various diplomatic office affected by other countries, so yeah, that's self-explanatory. Uh, improve relations, which just how... I think that works a bit like a modifier, so it means uh, it'll boost your chances of having a diplomatic uh, 
Didn't my like choice being accept, uh, accepted? You choose your rivals. I've got Reconquest, cast his bellies. It works the same way as Crusader Kings. You need pretty much cast his belly to start a war, but it's not required. I get to think it is in Crusader Kings. It isn't required in a European universe SARS, but you do take a massive hit, as I'll show you later. Uh, economy, pretty much self-explanatory. How much how you maintenance? How much money you're making? What the inflation's at? That's pretty much all you need to know. Trade, where you can just send, um, where you can send your merchants. Technology, which, again, self-explanatory and just tells you what you unlock next time you go up. Much easier than using Crusader Kings. I still don't understand Crusader Kings as a technology. It tells you what technology group it in. So I'm in the Nomad group, which means technologies cost 175% of normal and reduces your monthly power by one. And then I can have the option to westernize later on. Ideas, which very similar to technology, but these give you just extra bonuses. Um, I think I read that it's very important as a Crimea to focus on these rather than technology. Um, missions, so I'll choose a mission now so I can either improve my prestige, save the Tartar people in Azov, or protect our brethren in Azov, pretty much the same thing. Uh, yeah, exactly the same, give me the same bonus, so I might as well choose one of them. Uh, <laughs> which one do I go for? Save the Tartar, you gotta save the source. Uh, okay, stability. Again, you just manage overextension. I'll explain that later when it comes to my war, inevitably, with Genoa. I'll explain that. Um, religion. Uh, it's just, as being a Sunni, I uh, have a piety modifier which shows you. Um, so if you have no piety, you get better tax, better manpower, and less technology cost. But if you have more, if you're more pious, you get better missionary strength, better morale for your armies, and better fourth defense. Different kind of things. Uh, military, which is higher leaders, and where you can upgrade your tech units uh, once you've uh, went up in technology, as well as showing a uh, army tradition, land morale, force limit, just things like that. Just little modifiers that can help, and then subjects which I can't click on because I don't have any subject nations. Um, so I'll recruit a leader, which is simply done by doing this. So I've got a leader with two in fire. One in uh, none in shock, none in maneuver, but one in siege. I get mixed up siege is self explanatory maneuver. I've never understood what that does. What does actually do? Just moving speeds of units, not massively important, really. Shock is the amount of casualties, shock phase, and that's a fire phase. They're pretty similar, so as long as you've got one good in there, I think, though, in the early periods, especially, you wanted one with a good shock modifier, not a fire modifier that becomes more important later on but either way he's still general might as well keep him so i'll recruit him over here like so okay i'll just sort out my rivals now so i can have only a few nations here to choose from the regard as being similar in army size similar in navy size and overall similar in just power really so it makes sense to go for genoa since i'm going to war with them and this is what Choosing them as a rival gives me, it gives me 25% prestige, going to defeat them in battles, 20% 20 inspire offense, and minus 33% to the max power cost for the man problems of the peace deal. So they're very important to have them as a, a rival. Who else is a good one? Uh, Georgia, possibly, they normally get conquered by Kara. What I did in my multiplayer game was I vassalized them um, and then annex them, which I might do again this time around, so I'll choose them as well. And the Golden Horde makes more sense than if we were in Poland because they're pretty powerful at this time. So I better uh, choose the Golden Horde there. Okay, so I could choose an advisor, but if I click on the advisors over here, they cost about one monthly. They do increase a lot and 16 base price. They have a plus one and a plus two, as you can see along the side. That means so if I hired him as an advisor, I get plus one monthly increase. For administrative power, so I'd go to plus six rather than plus five. Um, but I don't think because I'm only making a profit point nine seven. I could afford it, but I'm not going to do it at the minute. Though I will focus completely on admin. I'll ignore diplomatic and military. Uh, I forgot to mention they do come with different uh, bonuses that they give to your nation. Um, so the first thing I shall do actually trade. I might check. Oh no, doesn't matter. They're sorted. I'll just leave it as it is. Better leave them as it is if you cry me, yeah, I suppose. Um, so Genoa, I'll be having a declare war. The Empire and Austria protect them. Actually, I shall change my mind to that because I nearly have done this mistake before. It's better to ally the Ottomans first because they're quite a protective nation. 
So I think I will go with them and just advance time slowly when they accept it, like so. And who else? Um, Kandor? Nah, I'll decline Kandor just because they're often conquered by the Ottomans early on in the game, really early on especially. Um, it might be somebody else like an ally. Um, from not really around here, the Ottomans are the main focus though, because their, their ships will help out a lot down here. So I'll keep them there. Now I can probably declare war on Genoa. And Ottomans will come in and help me. Uh, I want the conquest, cast a spell, and declare war. So this should go fine actually, because they don't have any unit station here, so I'll split them in half and he can go there and you can go here and then they should advance on there like so, there we go so I'll explain siege uh, straight after um, well I'll explain it now I suppose um, so how this siege works is you get like a dice roll, so it's on minus 63% so it means basically I can't win this siege because it's on minus 63%, it needs to be a positive percentage number because that shows your percentage chance of winning the siege if that makes sense. Difficult to explain really. Um, but all it works is, so you see this this like clock icon, I just won the battle as of, I didn't realize that unit there. Um, this is like, well, 20, next siege phase, so that's how it works, Is that's just a siege phase and once you reach the end you get a dice roll so it says eight so between the chance of five and ten it's it's quite complex really but it, it's easier to understand what it does complex to explain at least i find it uh, ally no guy i normally ally them anyways even though they only get pawned at the start really um who else do i need to uh ally don't think there's anybody else